scanning for audio. Welcome to a Tin Dog Podcast, this time talking about the novel adaptations number six, Damaged Goods. Now, Damaged Goods is an interesting little creature, something that if you're not familiar with Big Finish, you should consider giving a go, and you can buy it individually, not just in the double pack. The standard edition brings you a perfectly good story, and that's what I'm going to talk about in a moment. There is, of course, a deluxe edition which gives you more making of, and... Well, it's just plain gorgeous because you get this and a fourth Doctor story. That's something I'll be talking about next time. Damaged Goods, however, which you can have for twelve ninety nine as a download, is just one of the greatest pieces of Big Finish nonsense ever. No, that's not fair. It's just one of the greatest things ever to come out of Big Finish. Except it doesn't come out of Big Finish, does it? No, it comes from virgin novelizations. You see, in what Paul Cannell called the theme park years, or the wilderness years to the rest of us, or when, say, Doctor Who just wasn't coming back. In the great and glorious days when, well, Paul McGann was just about to turn up back in 1996, when we thought Doctor Who might come back, but only as an American series, the Virgin novelizations were the home of the Seventh Doctor. They were where Doctor Who lived. The Seventh Doctor had become... Cheeky, manipulative, trapped in his own webs of lies, his storylines had become so convoluted and dark and mysterious and damn good that that's the sort of thing that we ended up in Big Finish. He had Bernice, Ace had left, and by this point he had Chris and Roz, who were basically, well, judges from the Judge Dredd universe. Not quite. They were enforcers, peacekeepers. And into this world... We had a variety of people who would make their name eventually writing, well, Doctor Who on TV. Mark Gatiss had knocked out a couple of stories. Paul Cannell had provided us with human nature. And a host of very identifiable names had all turned up. But one name is important to the return of Doctor Who, and it's a name we all know. It's Russell T. Davis, and he produced this book. So imagine it. Before Doctor Who came back to our TV, Russell wrote this novel. Now, his experience of writing the novel has been, well, catalogued elsewhere. It wasn't the most wonderful experience for him, and it was slightly rushed. But, if you've not written for Doctor Who, you end up producing the sort of story that you always wanted to write for Doctor Who. You also think, I might not get to do this again, so I'll put everything I think of that's important here. You end up with moments that are pivotal. They used to be called punctums, moments that sum up the entire narrative. Perhaps that isn't quite what we're going for here. So basically, this bloke who'd written a bit of telly, who was a big Doctor Who fan, gets to write some Doctor Who. And that's it. So this book goes away, lives on people's shelves, and eventually, ten years later, we end up with Doctor Who back on our TV. Very nice, thank you very much. And now, after RTD's been gone for years... Big Finish turn up and go, right, we're adapting these novels. Can we possibly do your novel, Russell, as an audio? In that intervening gap, of course, Big Finish had turned up. So this novel gets to breathe life into a McCoy story that McCoy wasn't really in. So this is the first time he's ever acted in this particular narrative. Damaged Goods was one of those books with a particularly scary cover. It had a grave on the front with tentacles coming out of it, dragging someone down. And for that reason, I'd always meant to get around to reading it, but never quite had. So, you now know the background. Written by Russell T. Davis, adapted by Jonathan Morris. Jonathan Morris, a man responsible for giving us really good Big Finish stories. And directed by Ken Bentley. You've also got Travis Oliver and Yasmin Bannerman playing the Doctor's companions. You've got Michelle Collins, her off 42 episode, and EastEnders playing, well, Winnie Tyler, 
Yes, that's Tyler. And at one point in the story, she does joke that she was going to call one of her children Pete. She also has a daughter, surprisingly not called Rose. So basically, if you didn't know the background and you listened to this, you could be mistaken as thinking that this is a load of fan nonsense written by someone trying to write like Russell T, throwing, throwing everything that is Russell T into the mix. It's set on a council estate very much like Rose. But this is the grittiness, the darkness of the Virgin novelizations. It's enormously violent, and apparently the novel was even more violent. It's dark. It deals with things that you just don't get on Doctor Who, like drug abuse and dealers. But it's also got things that feel like... They're straight out of, say, the Cyber King. And there's one throwaway remark, which I will talk about after the end credits. Because if I talk about it now, it's just a can of worms you don't need. But let's face it, it's talking about something called the Institute. And I'll get back to that in a moment. But enough of that nonsense. Here's the synopsis. The year is 1987. And there is a deadly new narcotic on the scene on the streets of London. As part of their investigations, the Doctor and his companions, Chris and Roz, move into the Quadrant, a run-down housing estate. An ancient alien menace has been unleashed, and a menace somehow linked to a local gang leader known as the Kappa. And his mother, Winnie, the enigmatic Fry Foundation, and Eva Jericho, a woman driven to the brink of madness. As London descends into an apocalyptic nightmare, the Doctor must uncover the truth about the residents of the Quadrant and a desperate bargain made one dark Christmas Eve. Yes, that kind of sums it up, and I know in a moment I'll play you the, the trailer, but it's just a great piece of storytelling. Yes, there are throwaway and rather clever references to the modern series, but there's a surprising amount of stuff that, well, just feels like Russell T. Davis's Doctor Who. Yes, there are gay characters turning up, and if you wanted to go on about some sort of agenda, you f feel free to do that on your own time, but not on mine. Everything's really well dealt with, and it feels so 1980s, but it's nice that the people from the future, who might as well be time agents, but they're just not, work well here too. So, I would suggest, if you don't listen to Big Finish as a rule, go out and get this. Listen to this. Experience this story. Because if ever you didn't like The Seventh Doctor, and as far as I'm concerned you were wrong, get this one. Think again. Listen to the performances and the quality and the banter. You can imagine Capaldi delivering these lines. You can imagine this story being on TV. But best of all is the brand new theme tune. The theme tune that could have been the Seventh Doctor's evolved theme tune. You were listening to it at the beginning and it just was magnificent. I'll play you a few bars after I've talked about the Institute. So here's the trailer, then my credits, then the music, and then I'll talk about the Institute. So until next time, unless you're hanging on, be seeing you. I remember that night like it was yesterday. Christmas Eve 1977. The night the tall man came. Coming soon from Big Finish Productions. Doctor Who. Damaged goods. Much as I love late 20th century Earth, what are we doing here? Smile. What? Smile, Roz. Smile. Roz and I are trained adjudicators. We have some experience in narcotics investigation. But this is no ordinary investigation. You said you'd make my son better. You said you were doing everything you could. What can you say? Everything. This area is under the control of the British Army. All persons are to be evacuated at once. War must be fought. The war must be won. Remember when I said things might be worse than I thought? Well, they are very much worse. Something has found its way to Earth, and it's older and more dangerous than I thought possible. Doctor! That creature is attacking the building! It killed him! All those people just like that for no reason! Remember it, Belle? Remember why it makes you cry? Say it out loud for the first time in your life. And it will haunt you no more. Big Finish. We love stories. You've been listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. 
Available on RSS, iTunes, Stitcher, Audioboom and Tumblr. Doctor Who and its associated works are copyright of the BBC. No infringement is intended. You can contact the show, donate, buy merchandise or find out more about my other projects by visiting the Tin Dog Podcast homepage and clicking on the links. The Tin Dog Podcast is a founder member of the Doctor Who Podcast Alliance. So without wanting to be a spoiler, I need to talk about the throwaway remark, because this could be huge. This is the fanist reproach, obviously. It could just be the author approach, which would just be a throwaway fun remark. Except it's a bag of it's a bag of cans of worms, if you think about it. Now, some time ago, in Big Finish, they did do a throwaway reference to the Ninth Doctor turning up, and everyone did a little bit of a dance, but this was at the beginning. This was when people thought they could get away with it, and Nev Fountain did get away with it, but it's never happened since. Here, however, we've got a Russell T. Davis storyline. There is talk of Big Finish having big new news, and they are dealing with unit, new unit, on audio. But here's the biggest thing of all. Torchwood gets mentioned in this story. The Torchwood Institute is the shadowy group that replaces what was in the novel as the Brotherhood, an ongoing evil group. There is a reference to Torchwood in this story. Torchwood existing is a modern piece of Doctor Who. That means that they have either A, just managed to get something under the wire as a throwaway remark, that's fine, or B, more importantly for us, got the rights to use Torchwood. Now, Getting the permission to use Torchwood as in it was created by Russell T and Russell T's already given you the rights, that's fine. I can live with that. That's not a problem. However, if they've got the rights to make new Torchwood, and let's face it, that has been mentioned by, well, Barrowman himself, Audio Torchwood would be brilliant. The ones made by Radio 4 were superb last time. They really were great. And Big Finish could make them even better. I don't know what they're going to do by reconciling the universes because they've so gone off on different tangents. But you know what? I can so live with it either way. Perhaps, and this is something I really would like, I'd like I'd like there to be a storyline where you dealt with Captain Jack's missing year. The year that he had wiped. That year could have any doctor involved. He could be a companion without realising he's been a companion. It was implied, and that is brilliant. So... I will let you go, and I will let you experience the wonderment that is this, because let's face it, it's a great story, and it's not just fan nonsense. It demonstrates precisely how much RTD loves Doctor Who. And you know what? Here's to you, Russell. A fantastic script based on a fantastic story from a lifetime ago. So until next time, be seeing you. We've got Captain Jack himself, John Barrowman, about the return of Torchwood. That is to say, the beginning of Torchwood as produced on audio by Big Finish Productions. The 21st century is when everything changes, and Big Finish is ready. Thank you, John. Mr. Nida. Mr. Nida. Mr. Nida. Mr. Nida.